This week, we take a new step. We spent six weeks on the very first step. The first angel's message we spent, we finished our overview, yet it's been far from the exhaustion of the subject of the first angel's message. I'm not going to speak for you, but I will speak for myself. I learned a lot from the first angel's message that has never been exposed before. Yeah. And it's been a blessing. But the question arises now. 
How are these messages linked together? And why is it so important to progress through them in order? So often we hear sermons and it's all about the third angel's message and very, very few times is the three angels' messages given in their order. And therefore, God can't bless those sermons. And this is why we're going through this three angels' messages in their order, asking God to unpeel everything that shouldn't be there and reveal what we need to learn. Sister White wrote this. The proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages has been located by the word of inspiration. Not a peg or a pin is to be removed. No human authority has any more right to change the location of these messages than to substitute the New Testament for the Old. It is a reality. So many times, the Old Testament is the gospel in figures and symbols. When we're talking with people in the community, they say, well, why do you need to worry about the Old Testament? That's for the Jews. How many of you heard that? Everybody does. And I love the way a, a pastor on 3ABN I, it comes on at 5 o'clock Sabbath mornings. And I, I get to watch him every once in a while. Uh, right now, he's not on. I, I, I was kind of disappointed. But he brought out this point. And we need to share this with people. If you want to do away with the Old Testament because it has to do with the Jews, then guess what? You're going to have to do away with the New Testament because what was Jesus? A Jew. You can't get around it. The Jewish people were only the, the vehicle in which God was trying to reach the whole world for salvation. And because of our... This is why it's so important for us to realize that any culturalism, any, any type of separation is demonic. The reason why Christians are so intent in separating themselves from the Jewish is because Satan has inspired in that direction. Because he knows if he can divide, then, then the Bible can be of less importance. The New Testament is the substance of the figures and symbols of the Old Testament. The one is as essential as the other. The Old Testament presents lessons from the lips of Jesus Christ. And these lessons have not lost their force in what? Any particular. As we heard from William Miller's experience himself, his conversion, his preaching of the soon coming of Jesus Christ last Sabbath, we need to review the Millerite people's experience and look at it a little closer. The reason for that is, is because the second angel's message was actually preached by William Miller. Right. And we left that little part out on purpose. <laughs> but the reality is that the second angel's message also was preached. But why was the second angel's message preached before 1844? Ellen White testifies of her experience personally. Our hopes now centered on the coming of our Lord in 1844. And I have to stop there because I stopped there when I was writing this, getting it all together. And I, my mind just automatically hit on something. Do we live as Christ is coming in 2012? Not that I'm saying he's going to come in 2012. That's not what I'm saying. But are we living as he is coming in 2012? Amen. Because if, if our lives are not 
centered around the focus that Christ is soon coming daily, moment by moment, we will get caught up in the minutia of foolishness that's out there in the world. Because our minds won't be focused on what's going on in heaven and we won't be expecting His return. This was also the time for the message of the second angel who flying through the midst of heaven cried, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. That message was first proclaimed by the servants of God in the summer of 1844. As a result, many left the fallen churches. Now, why did they leave these fallen churches? There's a reason for it. You see, William Miller was preaching in the Baptist church on one Sunday. And the next Sunday he was over at the Methodist church in the town next door. And the following Sabbath he may have been in a Presbyterian church. His whole sermon was on the second coming of Christ. And it didn't matter what faith you were in, what denomination you were in. Everybody wanted to hear the today's message. And they wanted to hear it from William Miller. And so he was in all of these churches. But it caused a problem. Why? Because the ministers of those churches started rejecting the idea that Jesus was coming in October 22, 1844. And so one by one, these ministers would ban the Millerite movement out of their church. And very quickly it became evident that God was taking and saying, come out. I'm going to set you aside for a special purpose. In connection with this message, the midnight cry was given, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. In every part of the land, the light was given concerning this message. The cry arose thousands, aroused thousands. It went from city to city, village to village, and in the remote country regions. It reached the learned, the talented, as well as the obscure and humble. And then a most beautiful statement that I think can easily be overlooked when reading Sister White's writings. She said, this was the happiest year of my life. Can you just think about that for a minute? Why was it the happiest year of her life? You see, she accepted Jesus Christ through the Millerite movement. And her expectations of seeing his face coming closer and closer, it was the happiest time because everything was focused on seeing Jesus. My heart was full of glad expectation. But I felt a great pity and anguish, anxiety for those who were in discouragement and had no hope in Jesus. You see, the thing of it is, is when we, right now, today, in 2012, when we see and have that expectation that they had back then, that Jesus is coming soon, we are going to have an anxiety and pity for those who don't have that same fervor. And we are going to seek after them. We're going to try every way we can in our conversation and in our, in our demeanor to reach out to them. We're not going to close ourselves in. And that's why we've got all the DVDs and the CDs and the, and the literature to give you guys tools to share with people. Yes. Amen. I'm just thankful for the
the amount of people that are being blessed by what we do here. We've crossed a thousand people visit, visiting our YouTube site. Over a thousand. It doesn't matter how many is in the sanctuary. The seventh sermon of this series has been watched over 120 times. We couldn't even fit 120 people in here. With the DVDs of that sermon and what's on online, over 300 people have seen that sermon. Amen. That's what we know of. Only God knows how many. But the simple act of making a DVD, a video sermon, people are watching it and they're understanding that Christ is in the most holy place, their high priest, right now. They can see the video of a sermon of worshiping God as creator and the necessity of it. Doesn't matter whether you're a Seventh-day Adventist, a Baptist, or Methodist. We need to worship God as creator. And what that means is important. We're united as a people. Oh, I thank God that this church is united. Thank God for it. Amen. The only way a church can be useful in God is that it be united. Right. Yes. We united as a people in earnest prayer for a true experience. The unmistakable evidence of our acceptance with God. The Millerite movement had no intention of starting a new organization. But when they found themselves rejected by the church people that were their closest friends because of their personal conviction of the soon coming of Jesus, they were forced to band together in common belief that Jesus Christ was coming in 1844. The beautiful depiction of what Jesus himself was doing for this group of people should draw us ever closer and realize that even now in 2012 Jesus is doing the same thing right now for us right. it's the only way things happen in this church and when I share it with my wife she says you got to be kidding you got to be kidding. How many of us were surprised at what happened when we made the call for funds for Pastor Steve in Kenya? It was a shock to raise almost $2,000 and never pass a plate. Yeah. This sanctuary is holy. And God says when you lift him up and give him glory, he takes care of your needs. And two weeks later, he says, okay, you've shown faith. Now here's the place where I want you to call yours. Amen. Jesus commissioned other angels to fly quickly to revive and strengthen the drooping faith of his people and prepare them to understand the message of the second angel and the important move which was soon to be made in heaven. You see, when you get kicked out of the church where you were baptized, reading the experience of Ellen White as she is being banished from the church that her membership was in, the discouragement, the frustration, Jesus says he commissioned other angels to do one thing, that was to lift them up to realize that they've got a work that still needs to be done. And we have a work that still needs to be done. Amen. We make just small inroads all to make the greatest ones. I saw these angels receive great power and light from Jesus 
and fly quickly to earth to fulfill their commission and to aid the second angel in his work. The light from the angels penetrated the darkness where? Everywhere. 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 Satan and his angels sought to hinder this light from spreading and having its designed effect. I feel sorry for people when they say, don't go here, don't go there. Because they're doing Satan's work, not God's. They contended with the angels from heaven, telling them that God had deceived the people and that all of their light and power, they could not make the world believe that Jesus Christ was coming. You know, there's, there's a lot of people that they don't believe in the second coming of Christ. You know why? Because you have people like Camping and many others that are forecasting these things. Oh, and they, every time they're proven wrong, the Left Behind series detracts from the reality of Christ coming soon. All of these her heresies that are flowing through Christian ranks all have its effect of the necessity to understand that we are in the judgment now. It's hard. But Christ has promised that these angels will help us and give us words to say. But notwithstanding, Satan strove to hedge up the way and draw the minds of the people from the light. And the angels of God continued their work. These simple Bible students took hold of God's truth and systematically laid the foundation of the Seventh-day Adventist message, which this church endeavors to always uphold. Amen. The historic, fundamental foundation of this church has been laid, and we are not going to re-examine to see how we can shift it around. There's too many Adventist ministers now shifting and questioning that foundation. God laid it. Let's believe it. And let's stand on it. But the question must be answered. Why this particular order? Why? The first and second angels' messages were given in 1843 and 44. And we are now under the proclamation of the third. But all three messages, all three messages are still to be proclaimed. It is just as essential now as ever before that we shall be repeat, they shall be repeated to those who are seeking truth by pen, by voice, and I'll add by DVD. Amen. We are to sound the proclamation, showing their order, the application of the prophecies that bring us to the third angel's message. And this is the most important part. There cannot be a third without the first and second. Amen. Sister White makes another statement. I don't have it in my presentation. She says, those that have come under the third angel, they have to first go back and get the experience of the first and the second. You see, it's in the first angel's message that the everlasting gospel is explained. And we dealt with it. 
The everlasting gospel is so watered down today. Ellen White calls it sugar religion. Oh, man. Everybody likes stuff sweet. <laughs> when, we're at, when we're trying to get so much dessert, sometimes we need to start out, Lord, forgive us. <laughs> forgive us. It's serious. The everlasting gospel has the power of victory. And unless you believe that the everlasting gospel has the victory over sin possible for your life, you haven't even gotten to the first angel's message yet. Right. When we deal with men in our history like Frome, who, who literally was a Roman Catholic priest, masked as a, a general conference official, stating that it was impossible to overcome in sin. We learned that this man was put in the Adventist church for the one purpose of destroying our message. It's serious. When you start reading his book, I, was, I, could, I had his book and I had another one by Anderson, who was the other individual who was a Roman Catholic Jesuit priest put in the church to destroy our message. And reading Anderson's books, I couldn't figure out what there was so wrong, but I knew it didn't make much sense because it didn't go con it didn't go in cooperation with Haskell. And I'm trying to figure out why, where is he coming from? And when I found out where he was coming from, I said, okay, file 13. We need to be careful who we're listening to. Know where their history is. Know where they got their theology. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. I was talking to one gentleman just two weeks ago. His face turned white when I told him the shepherd's rod theology is a morph theology of Greek Orthodox and Adventism. He didn't know, or at least he wasn't prepared to realize that I knew That's why it's so dangerous. When you start mixing the good with the bad, you can make anything sound good. You mix enough lemonade with arsenic, and arsenic's going to taste good. Think about it. These messages are to give the to, we are to give to the world in publications, in discourses. Showing the line of prophetic history. The things that have been. And what? Things that will be. And things that will be. And this sermon, we are going to be dealing. We're going to just put our toes in it. Of seeing the things that will be. We're going to get there in just a moment. The everlasting gospel must be proclaimed as God loving sacrifice for all who will come to Him to recognize their individual need and worship Him as Lord, King, and Creator to cooperate with the judgment going on in heaven right now. When these tree truths are brought to the forefront in present day professed Christianity will separate themselves from those who desire complete victory, victorious Christianity. Those who desire the world will not want to be around you. It's just a fact. And we are going to mourn the loss of friendship when we don't like, I, 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 I mourn the loss of some of my friends. I, I enjoy talking with people. But when they don't want to be around you because of your stand, it hurts. 
it hurts. Hence, God says this. And there followed, what? Another, Another angel saying, Babylon is fallen. Is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Today we are not looking at Babylon from an individual perspective. That starts next week. So if there was any real sermon you needed to skip, that was this week. <laughs> and since you're here, you don't have to leave. You get the foundation too. But instead of from an individual perspective, we are going to look at it from an ecclesiastical viewpoint. The second angel's message has more than one aspect to it. And so the first message that comes out is an ecclesiastical one. So what is the origin? And that got messed up. What does it mean is number one. In my notes, I didn't change it. Then, what is its origin? Then we are going to talk about what is Babylon. And that you're going to be surprised. Where did it fall from? Who is a part of Babylon? Then we're going to go to the wine of Babylon. And then the works of Babylon. And we've got just under 45 minutes to do seven sections. So we're going to move fast, so hold, put your seatbelts on, let's go. The origin of Babylon. What is its origin? Babel, Tower, of Babel. Tower of Babel, that's correct. The origin of Babylon was given in the 11th chapter of Genesis. After the flood, the people came to the plain of Shinar and said to one another, let us build a city, a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And then the next, the next word, it kind of, yesterday as I was going over my sermon and stuff, I'm going, I didn't see that before. What does the next few words say? Let us what? Let us make us a name. What does that say? What's that saying to you? Let us make us a name. They're organizing. They want to be setting themselves apart. To set themselves up. This is who we are. Who's the one doing it? Is it God or self? self? That's the first thing I thought of. I go, wow. These people are all about self. Let us make us a name. Let's glorify in what we can do. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord saw what they, what, imagined to do and confounded their language so that they could not continue to build. Thus, that which they thought to avoid did what? Came upon them and they were scattered abroad. The one thing every single one of us need to remember if you are outside of God's will and you're trying to prevent something from happening, that is exactly what God is going to do. Amen. Because He's bigger than you. Hallelujah. And He's going to remind you through those circumstances. So what does Babylon mean? Everybody knows the answer. Babylon means what? 
confusion. confusion and disorder. Oh, yes. So many times our board meetings and business meetings and everything is more confusion and disorder. And I'm wondering, does anybody of us, any of us ever listen to ourselves? You know. Oh, God help us as a people. We talked about it in Sabbath school class. It's unconverted minds coming together and all we're doing is trying to make sure that our opinions and our theologies that we've created is what happens. And it's not, that's not God. The, the name of the city which they began to build was called Babel. Which means confusion because their language as well as their lofty ideas was confounded. Since Babel or Babylon means confusion, it is evident that the term is not limited to a particular spot or city. But that wherever there is confusion, there is what? Babylon. Babylon. Before anybody gets concerned, I'm not going where you think I'm going. Yet. So what is Babylon? Babylon does not comprise of the whole wicked world. Jane Andrews was in his book, The Three Messages of Revelation 14, is is so, so precise. It was one of the books that was required by every Seventh-day Adventist minister to not only have it in his, in his library, but to have studied it. And over 80% of the ministers have never even heard of the book. Which is a crying shame. Since Babel or Babylon means convert confusion, it is evident that is not a particular spot. Andrew says, it does not consist of some literal city. Some one literal city. It's in your notes. Fill it out. But that it is composed of what? Professed, Professed worshippers of God we think can be clearly shown. This is not an abstract question, but an eminently practical and it is intimately connected with our duty towards God. So where did it fall from? Where did Babylon fall from? Those who are willing to be taught What does that sentence start out? What does that infer? That there are a lot of people who are not willing to be taught. Amen. Okay? So, if you're not willing to be taught, you're not going to get this. Those who are willing to be taught may learn a lesson from the conduct of the king of Babylon. As the enemy sought to make God-given light serve his own purposes by leading the king to work for his own glory instead of working for the glory of God. So he works. Who? So who works? Satan. Satan. That's correct. So Satan works today to pervert the truth in order to hinder God's purposes. Whenever you have ministers twisting the historical beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist message, you know they are not speaking after God's order, but after Satan's. And this is why she says, the hellish torch of Satan will be in our pulpits. we got to be careful who we're listening to. All false religion. How much? All. In other words, it's all inclusive. You cannot get around it. All false religion 
has its origin in a corruption of what? The truth. When unmixed with evil, the truth is a mighty power to save. Yes. Thank God. Thank God. But if we allow the enemy to work through us, if by the light given us, we seek to exalt self, even this truth may become a power for evil. Even this church who is grounded standing on the historical foundation of our church, lifting up the old standards that we had as a people, can be turned into what? A power of evil. God, help us that it doesn't happen. What is the one ingredient? What is the one ingredient? Self. To exalt self. And as long as we aren't here to exalt self, what's going to happen? It's going to stay pure, isn't it? So the question is, number five, who is part of Babylon? <laughs> In Revelation 17, Babylon is represented as a woman a figure used in scriptures as a symbol of a church. A virtuous woman represents a what? Pure church. A vile woman, an apostate church. And as I was reading this this week, I'm looking at it and I'm, okay, now, the picture of a pure, virtuous woman. How does she look? How does she look? Okay. She doesn't draw attention to herself. Even though she may have a very sexy figure, she doesn't accentuate it for the male passions. She's not prideful in what she wears. She's modest. I'm almost plain, but not quite. She doesn't glorify herself by what she wears. She's glorifying what? God. Her husband. Which is Jesus Christ. But now we have this vile woman. What does she look like? Oh man. Sexually accentuated dressing. Accentuating the wealth of her being through jewelry, making herself look real out there pretty. You know, I don't care if you're a man or a woman, when you're getting dressed every day, you need to ask yourself, am I dressing like the vile woman or the virtuous woman? <laughs> Am I dressing for self or am I dressing for God? And I think we, we would be mindful that even when we are through the, the six days of the week, we are still representing Christ and how we dress. And we need to remember that. Babylon is said to be a harlot. I don't need to describe what a harlot looks like. And the prophet beheld her drunken with the blood of the saints and martyrs. The Babylon thus described represents Rome. That apostate church which has so cruelly persecuted the followers of Jesus Christ. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, 1884, which is the original Great Controversy. For those who aren't aware of that. The woman of Revelation 12 represents the church comprised of a virtuous woman and her seed. 
And guess what? Therefore, the harlot or vile woman and her daughters, those together compose the total city of Babylon. Now let's see. If our pioneers and Sister White agree, Jane Andrews, Babylon is not limited to a single ecclesiastical body. And for those who are watching on DVD and YouTube who are not Seventh-day Adventists, please, we are not talking about individuals right now. We are talking about ecclesiastical bodies. It would be shuddering for some people to know that every single major de denomination on the face of this earth recognizes that the Bible Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, is Saturday, not Sunday. Every single major Christian denomination accepts the reality and fact that when you are going to worship God on His holy day, it is the seventh day of the week, Sabbath. It is not Sunday. You can put all kinds of bows around the theology to excuse the reason why you go to church on Sunday. But God didn't make it holy. He didn't sanctify it. He didn't set it apart. And therefore, you're worshiping on the wrong day. Babylon is not limited to a single ecclesiastical body. But that is the very name renders it necessary that it should be composed of what? Many. Many. Babylon has made all nations drunken with her wine. It can therefore symbolize nothing less than the universal what? Worldly church. You see, You've had for many years Greek Orthodox, which is a branch off from the Roman Catholic Church. You've got the Church of England. You have all of these different denominations, and they're all part of Babylon. We're going to understand why. But Babylon the harlot is the mother of daughters who follow her example of corruption. Thus are represented those both. Thus are represented those churches that cling to the doctrines and traditions of Rome and follow her practices and who follow whose fall is announced in the second angel's message. Now get this. This next quotation in Great Controversy the 1888 version, page 382. It is clear here. The message of Revelation 14 announcing the fall of Babylon must apply to religious bodies that were once pure and have been come what? Corrupt. Corrupt. In other words, they became corrupt around the time of 1844. Think about it now. Since this message follows the warning of the judgment, it must be given in the last days. Therefore, it cannot refer to the Romish church. In other words, papal Rome. The fall of Babylon in Revelation 14 is not, what did I say? Not, not. Is not referring to papal Rome. Anyone who says that is not in con connection with the three angels' messages in their order and why they're there. Why is it not Rome? For that church 
has been in a fallen condition for what? Many centuries. It's clear. It's clear. Just as a history lesson, let's see how many of you guys get it. Who proclaimed the fall of Babylon as a papal power? Who was it that God ordained to proclaim the fall of the Roman papal power? Think about it. He took a hammer and a nail. Martin Luther. He was God's messenger to proclaim the fall of Babylon. Why? Because he, it is the mother of all Babylon. But it had already fallen and declared by not only Martin Luther, but many others. That's why we have the Reformation. Yes. We've got to know our history, folks. We've got to know our history. Oh, yes. As the churches refused. Uh-oh. Early writings. Here we go. As the churches refused to receive the first angel's message, they rejected the light from heaven and fell from the favor of God. any ecclesiastical power who rejects the first angel's message is what? Falling from the favor of God. Why do you think Satan came to the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1980? To destroy the sanctuary message. Because the sanctuary message is at the very heart of the first angel's message. And when you destroy the sanctuary message, you destroy a church that should be proclaiming it. And they take the first step toward battle. They haven't got there yet. We better be clear to understand that there is a demonic power trying to have its way in those upholding the Seventh-day Adventist message. It's not all peaches and cream. As the churches refuse to receive the first angel's message, we got to receive the first before we can go on. The sanctuary, the judgment is going on now. It affects us now. If we are not cooperating with it now, we will be lost. There won't be any worry about the, the mark of the beast or anything else. Because you won't be in. You, won't, you cannot receive the seal. You begin to receive the seal in the first angel's message. And if you haven't accepted the first and the second, when it comes time to receive the seal of God, you're going to be left out. It's not my words. They trusted in their own strength. Oh, if I just pray hard enough, if I get the right diet, if I do this, if I do that, I'll be okay. Yes, we have to have the right diet. But only as God empowers us to, to be able to, to do it. Because you cannot live the health message without the Holy Spirit living it in you. It's impossible. It'll drive you nuts. Oh, I gotta make sure I drink this amount of water. I gotta make sure I do this. I gotta make sure I do it. By the time you, you've been going crazy. But when the Holy Spirit is guiding your life, 
All of those things will be second nature. You won't have to worry about how many cups of water you drink because you'll be in tune with your body and your body will say, it's time to take a drink of water. It's time to go for a little exercise. It's time to get out in the fresh air. It's time. It's time. And you'll say, yes, Lord. I know I'm busy, but I will get up. I will go out. I will get that sunlight. Yes, Lord, I'll go. I'll get the drink of water. Because you're in tune with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will guide you and strengthen you. By opposing the first message, place themselves where they could not see the light of the second angel's message. But the beloved of God, who were oppressed, accepted the message. Babylon has fallen and what? Left the churches. Left the churches. Near the close of the second angel's message, I saw a great light from heaven shine upon the people of God. The rays of this light seemed to be bright as the sun. And I heard the voices of the angels crying, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. The second angel's message did not reach its what? Complete. Complete fulfillment in 1844. In other words, this message is still going on today. And this is why we've got to take them in their order. Because there are things going on today that still are going on and being fulfilled in the second angel's message. And we've got to keep in touch with what's going on. Then the churches then experienced a moral fall in consequence of their refusal of the light of the Edmund message. But that fall was what? Not complete. As they have continued to reject special truths for this time, they have fallen lower and what? Lower. Since she has not made what? All nations. All nations to do this. The spirit of world conforming and indifference to the testing truths for our time exists and has been gaining ground in the churches of the Protestant faith. It shouldn't be a surprise to you that the papal power just last week talked about Sunday as the created seventh day of the week and proclaimed worldwide. Did you not hear it? Or were you asleep? It's a reality. There's a strong cry in Protestant in, Catholic circles now to proclaim the Creator God and that Sunday is the seventh day of the week. And God set aside it to be holy. And when the Protestant world gets on board with Catholics, to promote creation instead of evolutionary creation and all the variations thereof which they're doing right now. They will get on board with papal power to strengthen their view on Sunday being the seventh day of the week. And what comes next? But if you're dead to the world, you're dead to what's going on in the world, you never know. That the Pope literally said that. There are Catholic churches right here in the United States on their church boards making it very clear. Let's have Sunday forced worship. We need to get back to that worship on Sunday. We clearly understand a few weeks ago, we were talking about worshiping God as creator. 
Just because the Pope has decided that Sunday is the seventh day of the week doesn't make it so. Amen. These churches are included in the solemn and terrible denunciation of what? The second angel. The second angel. But the work of apostasy has not reached its culmination. Notwithstanding the spiritual darkness and alienation from God that exists in these churches, which constitutes Babylon, the great body of Christ's true followers, are still to be found in their communion. That's why I started out beginning today helping us understand that this sermon is dealing it from an ecclesiastical viewpoint. There are a lot of good Baptists out there that are worshiping God every way they know because they have not heard the first angel's message. They have not heard the second angel's message. They are torn because they realize their church is becoming more and more worldly. And the pastors stand up there and just dribble and don't give them anything. And they leave on Sunday and go back to home and wonder why they even went there. And it's a crying shame that most of our Seventh-day Adventist churches on Sabbath are the same way. I'll never forget the dear sister in the back. The very first Sabbath we had service. And the afternoon house he testified as being a Seventh-day Adventist for nine years. And she testified how she would come to church every day, every Sabbath for nine years. And a preacher would preach a wonderful sermon. And before she got out to the car, she couldn't remember one word he said. Why? Because it went in one ear and out the other and there was nothing to hold it. You know, we got to have experiences. we got to have pastors who passionately believe what they're saying. And not just, well, this is my opinion. We have got to understand that the Baptist people are in Babylon and it's our duty to call them out with love. We've got to understand that our Methodist brothers and sisters are in Babylon and it's time for us to call them out. But how can you call them out if you're not living what you believe? If there's no distinction between you and them, why should they change if it's just today? We talked about that a few weeks ago. Watch the DVD. We've got to find out that we have to have Christ in us if we are going to be effective. There are many of these who have never seen the special views and the special truths for our time. Not a few are dissent. What, what does she mean, not a few? In other words, there is a whole lot of people out there who want to see Christianity real, not professed. It does my heart good when I have, when, when, when I have a member stand up and testify to the, for, the, for the Lord that a, a friend who saw her six months earlier says, there's something different about you. What's going on? Thank God. She could testify. She says, you know, I changed where I went to church. And now my faith is more real. It has nothing to do about me as a pastor. It has to do about a message that is held here. Amen. When we allow it to affect our lives, it changes things. Amen. Not a few are dissatisfied with their present condition. But they don't know where to go. 
They're the lost sheep. They have no idea where to go. They know the world isn't good. Where they're sitting isn't good. They look in vain for the image of Christ in the churches for which they are connected. And these bodies depart further and further from the truth. And ally themselves closer and closer to the world. To the point where there's no difference between. And the two classes will widen. And widen until finally to the Holy Spirit. The time will come. When those who love God, what? Supremely. Supremely. Can no longer remain in the connection where they're at. With such as are lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having the form of godliness, denying the power thereof. Revelation 18, 1. 2 and 4. And after these things I saw another angel flying down in the midst of heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The plagues are coming, folks. There should be urgency in the way we speak to our neighbors our friends saying come out of her my people it's hard for me to conceive how people cannot see this in this verse who's making the call God is and so when it says come out of her my people that's God's people in Babylon Brothers and sisters, you may have for the first time recognized you're in Babylon. Thank God he's calling you out. Amen. Don't get mad for thinking that I'm being accusing and judgmental against your faith. Thank God that he's calling you out. It's serious. This scripture points forward to a time when the announcement of the fall of Babylon as made by the second angel of Revelation 14 is to be repeated with additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the various organizations that constitute Babylon. In other words, what? There are some truths in the Methodist church. Did you know that? Yes. There are some truths in the Baptist church. There are some truths, guess what? Even in the Catholic church. And it is those truths that when we reach out and say, we're not condemning you as a person, we're saying, come where all the truth is. Why be satisfied with one crumb of good and a whole bunch of mold and mildew when you can have a fresh loaf of the Word of God? Amen. Personally, I don't like stale old bread. My wife hates it. She puts it in a toaster and makes it all nice and clean, nice and good again. Since that message was first given in the summer of 1844, you see these churches that existed in William Miller's time, they have continually gone downhill. Right. When you're sitting in a church for 25 and 30 years, you know that you're not being satisfied. You know that you don't have an experience with God, but you don't know anything else. And that's why it's our duty as a church. No matter where you go, whatever store you go to buy your groceries in, no matter where you go in life, take those tracks with you and share them. 
give the joy of God of your experience to those around you. A terrible condition of the religious world is here described. With every rejection of truth, the minds of people will become darker and darker. Their minds, their hearts will become stubborn until they are entrenched with the infidel party. In defiance of the warnings which God has given, they will continue to trample upon one of the precepts of the Decalogue until they are led to persecute those who hold it sacred. Christ is set at naught in the contempt placed upon his word and his people. As the teachings of spiritualism are accepted by the churches. I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> I'm going to say, today was the day to miss. The next two Sabbaths, we are going to be dealing with things from a clear standpoint to understand that spiritualism is even making its inroads into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we are in danger of fast running after hell when we are professing to go to heaven. It's dangerous where we're at. And we need to be careful to uphold the truths that God has given for us. The restraint imposed upon the corner of heart is what? Removed. Removed. And the profession of religion will become a cloak to conceal the basis iniquity. A belief in spiritual manifestations opens the door to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, and thus the influence of evil angels will be felt in the churches. And you will think it's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's when it gets dangerous. When you start thinking that you're receiving the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and it's Satan's demons filling you. Amen. So what is the wine of Babylon? We're going to deal with this wine and the works of Babylon in the next two weeks. We're going to spend a lot of time applying it to ourselves individually. Asking ourselves, how am I drinking? Am I drinking that wine? Or is my wine that I'm drinking diluted and I don't think it's wine when it really is? I'll never forget for the first and only time I had wine. I went to a presentation and the manufacturer had put out a punch. It was a great looking fruit punch. <laughs> and it was fruit punch. But it had a little punch to it. And the punch was a punch. And after about the second glass, I, th I said to the, my companions, this doesn't, there's something about this. I'm, I'm getting a lightheaded. <laughs> and she said, uh, oh, you didn't know it had champagne in it? I go, I'm sorry, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I was 23 years old then, 20, actually 22. I'm telling you what, it don't take much when you don't drink it ever. And it was well disguised. But it doesn't take much. And our doctrines and our belief system can 
can be watered down with just a little two or three drops of arsenic. And it's still deadly. Right. But this next quotation, let's see what it has to say. Manuscript Releases, Volume 1, page 302. And if you don't have the book and want to read it, I have the book in my library. The wine of Babylon is exalting the false and spurious Sabbath over the Sabbath of the Lord Jehovah. Hath blessed, sanctified for the use of man. Also what? The immortality of the soul. But get the last half of this paragraph. These kindred heresies and the re what does it say? Rejection. And the rejection of truth. Now, you have two heresies. And then she says, and the rejection of truth. So in other words, the rejection of truth is not about the Sabbath. It's not about the state of the dead. This rejection of truth is other things that is beside those two. And so when we as Seventh-day Adventists reject the sanctuary message, what are we doing? We put our running shoes on straight to hell and Babylon. When we say Christ cannot overcome our sins by faith in us, we're doing what? We're rejecting the truth and we're running straight toward Babylon. We haven't got there yet. But we're trying to. Lord, help us as a church to realize we are drinking the wine and it's not the wine that Jesus made Amen. of the fresh grape juice. But it's the fermented foolishness of this world. Kings, merchants, rulers, religious teachers are all in corrupt a harmony. And that's where I'm stopping. You have to come back next week. Now we're going to go to the works of Babylon in my book that I wrote. I referred to the works of Babylon, and I am barely going to touch it here. But there is a strong desire in our own church to manifest the works of Babylon and profess to be true followers of Jesus Christ. And you can't have it both ways. You're either a follower of Christ or you're not. And God's going to take care of this situation. Praise Him for it. What are the works of Babylon? In exposing the corruption of the Babylonian church of His time. Of whose time? Of His time. Speaking of Christ. Christ warned his own people to beware of like abominations. But be not ye called rabbi, says Christ. That is, master or doctor. For one is your master even Christ. And what? All. All ye are brethren. <clears throat> when we have ministers, if my brother ever watches a sermon, he's going to roll over in his chair. Even my brother is heading toward Babylon because of his incessant desire to now be called doctor.
because he is the authority on evangelism for this church. God help us. God help us as a people to think we know so much schools to get a degree to be claimed, proclaimed doctor this, doctor that. You're saying you know as much as Jesus Christ about the subject you are doctor of. That's blasphemy. I know nothing as I could and I'm still your brother I may have the role as pastor of this church but I'm still your brother and every day Tim teaches me something he's still the treasurer of the church. Because that's his duty. But as brothers, we can teach each other. Amen. As sister and brother, we can teach each other. And we don't have to say, call me Dr. This or Dr. That. And I don't even care. You, this medical profession. Doctors practice medicine. Okay? Remember, this little slogan. Doctors practice medicine. Physicians administer it. And there is a big difference between a doctor and a physician. Wrap your head around it a little bit. Think about it. And if you're still confused, next week we'll deal with it even more. Apparently, to imitate the Romish church, Protestants call their ministers reverend. This word which is to be used only in scripture, once in scripture, is there applied to who? God. To God. Psalms 111.9. Don't call anyone reverend. And every single time I have people do it to me. I said, I'm sorry, the only, the only one reverend is God. I'm just a pastor. That's my title for the church. But I'm never to be called reverend. And you'd be surprised the, the conversations we get. <laughs> You're not reverend? No, no, I'm not reverend. Only God is. Only God is to be called reverend. But I am pastor, his servant. Amen. It's a big difference. If it is a sin for the church to call her ministers rabbi or master, how much greater one must be for her to apply them to the title of reverend, which belongs to God alone? Not content with this, though. Some of these professed servants of Jesus Christ become right reverend or very right reverend and not a few of them become doctors of what divinity, divinity. oh that's dangerous <clears throat> to put yourself as Christ oh we would never claim to be the Pope but yet I have a doctor of divinity So great their proficiency in what? The, doctor. the doctrines of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it may be said that even corrupt Protestants 
should not be joined with Romanists as forming the great city of Babylon. That Romanists do what? They claim infallibility. And they are what? Proud of it. Which Protestants never yet have what? Done. They've never done it. But if Romanists claim infallibility in advance for the decrees and ordinances of their church, it is also true that Protestant bodies never afterward acknowledge wherein their churches or their councils or their board meetings or their business meetings have been in what? Error. We answer that in this, the difference exists only in name. To speak in the language of their several pretensions, Romanists never can err, Protestants never do err. I didn't say that. Jane Andrews said that. So that Protestant churches have all the advantages of infallibility and leave to the Romanist or the papal power to the idiom of claiming it. The question must be asked. Remember, we have been looking at this message from an ecclesiastical standpoint. We are not dealing with individuals, but we are dealing with ecclesiastical systems of religion. There are some who are not Babylon now, but they are trying to get there. There are those in Babylon who don't realize that they're part of Babylon because officially they claim to be worshiping on God's holy day. And I firmly believe there are many Baptist leaders and, and Methodist leaders around the world that have just never seen the light. I'm telling you, there, there, there are ministers who... The only thing that they know is what they're taught. That's right. That's the only thing they know. The question is, are you putting your faith and trust in ecclesiastical power or a thus saith the Lord? Because whether you're a Seventh-day Adventist, a Baptist, a Roman Catholic, a Presbyterian, or anything else, if you are putting your theology and your faith and trust in an ecclesiastical power, you will not make it. You cannot and will not receive the seal of God having your faith and trust in any ecclesiastical power. Because they will fail you. Sure. Only Christ. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you think you are going to get to heaven being a Baptist, a Methodist, or even a Seventh-day Adventist, you're not going to make it. You had better be a completely pure, holy Christian who has received the seal of God and his character fully reproduced in your life. Amen. Yes, the Seventh-day Adventist message is the only message to uphold. But if it is not a living oracle in your life, you will never receive the seal of God.
There's only one thing. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Thank you.